Amen. All right, well, we're there in Amos chapter number 5. Let's go ahead and start reading in verse number, uh, verse number 21 of Amos chapter, chapter 5. There the Bible reads this. It says, I hate, this is God speaking, of course, uh, through the prophet Amos, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of Moloch, and chewing your images, the star of, of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore I will, cause, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord whose name is the Lord of hosts. So here we're talking about the animal sacrifices. Of course, uh, we're going through this on Sunday mornings as well. In a way, we're talking about the Levitical priesthood and, and in that case, the, the garments of the high priest. But if, you, if you've read the Old Testament, and especially the first five books, you know that God takes the Levitical priesthood very seriously. Actually, throughout the Old Testament, uh, several people died when God's way of the Levitical priesthood was, was not done properly. This was something that was very ser serious. People, people died because they did not do it the way God wanted it to be done. But it's kind of interesting here because God's obviously upset about them doing the sacrifices. So it seems a little counterintuitive. He's using pretty strong language. He says, I hate. Uh, people today don't think that God hates anything. Well, he does. He hates a lot of things. Actually, earlier in the same chapter, you'll recall, God talks about how, uh, how we also should hate the evil and love the good. Uh, we shouldn't just be loving everything. There's a lot of things we should hate if we're going to hold fast that which is, is right and true. But notice here, God's upset about that they're doing animal sacrifices. You say, why is that? Well, you don't have to turn there, uh, but Hosea 6.6 6 says this. This is, again, God speaking. He says, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, in the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Here God is, there's a major theme in the Old Testament. There's a major theme where God is explaining, turn to Micah 6, 6, we'll look at one more, where God's explaining that, yes, he's very specific about the sacrifices and he wants them done. But the point is, is, is if, if, if the children of Israel or anybody, these people doing these sacrifices, if they were going to be living in rebellion against God and be, be doing all these wicked, evil things, worshiping all these false gods, God says, I'd rather you not even do them. I'd rather you not even do them. There's things I'd much rather you do then worry about all these, these sacrifices. You know, there in Micah 6, 6, here uh, the speaker is asking some rhetorical questions. He says in verse chapter 6, Wherewith, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? He's saying, what does God want? What should I bring him to please him? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with Ten thousand rivers of oil shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He's saying, what does God want? What should I offer? What should I sacrifice to him? Verse 8, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good. He says, he, God showed you what he wants more than this. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Here God says, here's what I really want. I want you to do justly, keep my commandments. I want you to be merciful. I want you to, just like I was merciful with you, and I want you to walk humbly with me. I want you to have a walk with, with the Lord. And it's funny because Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. You don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, and he brings up pretty much the same three things, just in a different way. He says to the Pharisees, because they were doing this. This is exactly what they were doing. They were, the Pharisees were all obsessed over all these little rules and all these, these commandments, and they were looking down their noses at other people, and, and they were, this is what they were doing. But then the major parts of God's word, the major commandments, they were, they were completely left undone. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. See, why were they hypocrites? What, what about it made them hypocrites? He says, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, which is good. He, those are things they should have been doing. But here's the problem. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, which are, 
um, in a way very similar to the three things we saw in Micah 6, which is interesting. But here he's saying, it, it's not, he says, these you ought to have to done. He's like, it's good that you're doing these things, but not to leave the other undone. Right. Verse 24, he says, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow camel. Here these Pharisees, just an example, they, they may look down at someone or, or uh, be, rebuke someone because they didn't have the borders of their garments the right color or because they didn't do this or that or they didn't pay the tithes they should have been paying, which they should have been doing, but at the same time the Pharisees were forsaking the much more important things of God's law, which is why God was rebuking them here in Amos. He's rebuking them here in Micah 6. He, he's saying, He's saying, just don't even do it then. He's like, it got to the point where God, he says, I, I hated when you even tried to do the sacrifices. Because you're here you are, you're doing all these, these sacrifices, you're keeping it by the book, but then you're worshiping false gods at the same time. These he ought to done and not to leave the other undone. So where are we going with this? So turn to uh, Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. So today, the Levitical priesthood is long gone. We don't a offer animal sacrifices anymore. We don't, um, you know, we're under the new priesthood of Melchizedek, of Jesus Christ. So we don't do these sacrifices anymore. But notice Hebrews 13, 16, which, of course, is in the New Testament, where, God, uh, where, the, where the Bible says this. He says, but to do good and communicate, forget not. Notice this, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Say, well, we don't do sacrifices anymore. Well, we may not do those sacrifices anymore, but there are things that even in the New Testament are considered sacrifices, things that God still wants us to do. The title of the sermon this evening, uh, if it had a title, is Boomerang Sacrifices. You say, what does that mean? Well, right here I have a boomerang. This is a boomerang, and the point of this boomerang, if, if you throw it right, it's appar they're apparently difficult to do, but if you throw it correctly, the point is it's a frisbee of sorts, that you throw it and it will come back to you. And the reason the sermon's called Boomerang Sacrifices is we're going to look at four things this evening that the Bible considers sacrifices. It calls them sacrifices, but they are things that while we do to God, they will come back and benefit us. Like many of God's commandments, it's not just a one-way thing. If we do them, uh, God will bless us. If we do them, it will be well with us. Think about how many times in the Old Testament God said, obey my commandments that it may be well with you. God wants it to be good for us, so... We're going to look at these four things this evening that are boomerang sacrifices. They will, uh, if, if done, they will come back and benefit us as well. So turn to Psalm 4-5. Psalm 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. The first one of these this evening is righteousness. Here there in Psalm chapter 4, look at verse 5. Psalm 4-5, the Bible says this, it says, offer, notice this, the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Look, God wants us, obviously it's not part of salvation, we're saved simply by trusting in Jesus Christ, but after salvation, God expects us, He wants us to live righteous lives. Yeah. And obviously, you know, this is, when we're talking about the word righteous here, we're talking about um, in comparison just to to other, because the Bible says in Romans 3, there's none that doeth good, there's, no, there's none that's righteous. Well, that's comparing us to God. But in, in comparison to the world, in comparison to those around us, God expects us to live to a higher standard. Yeah. God expects us to live. Job was a righteous man. Abraham, the Bible says, was a righteous man. And because they, they lived righteous lives in comparison to the world around them by following God's standards. Uh, for example, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So we're talking the first thing, this first boomerang sacrifice this evening is righteousness. Um, within that, I'd like to give, because we're talking about how, it how it's good for us, how it actually will improve our lives if we do these things. So I'd like to give you three reasons this evening to give you a righteous life. Uh, just within this point, three reasons to live a righteous life. Turn to Ephesians 4. The first reason that you should want to, other than just because God said so, the, the, the first reason that you should want to live a righteous life is because it's a critical part of, of, of salvation, but it's something that, uh, it's a critical part of salvation. It's not, you don't do it to be saved, of course, but after salvation, it's something God expects of you to, uh, to live a righteous life, to put on the new man. You're there in Ephesians 4, uh, look at verse 21. It says this, it says, If so be that ye have heard him, 
and have been taught by him, talking about Jesus, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and notice this, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the Bible's saying if you're saved, if you've heard the word of God and you're sealed and you're saved, you should be renewed. The spirit of your mind, the way you think, the way you should, you should, uh, uh, you, you should put on the new man. You should live a righteous life. You shouldn't just go back to the way you were. You shouldn't just go back to uh, the life you were living. It's not a part of salvation, but it's something God expects us to do. Amen. Think about it like this. When we got saved, the old man died. But how healthy the new man is is up to us. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like in James, you know, faith without works is dead. It can be dead, and still, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's still there, but it can be dead. Your, your spiritual life can be dead. It shouldn't be that way. It ought not be that way. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Look, living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, it's not, see, salvation's easy. Salvation's you believe on Christ and you're set for life. That's it. You believe on Jesus Christ and you're good to go. You never have to worry about being saved again. However, living in the Spirit it does require daily effort. It does require something that you pursue and you keep up with. You can't let it expire. You can't let it go away. It's not, it's not as easy as salvation. Turn to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. So, being righteous, why should we want to be righteous? Well, one, it's something God expects after salvation. But two, here's another reason you should want to. God provides special protection for the righteous. God provides special protection for the righteous. Now, of course, just a, just a couple disclaimers here. This does not mean nothing bad will ever happen to you, right? This doesn't mean a prosperity gospel. This doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen to you. It does not mean that God's protection will always be what we consider protection. It doesn't matter. It will always be in the, mean it always be in the form that we, we expect it to be in. Right. And it does not mean that evil people cannot get away with evil, okay? All these things are disclaimers, but there is a, a, there is a definite difference in the Bible with how God deals with, with evil people and how God deals with those who are righteous, Okay, it's, a, it's an important theme that ought not be ignored. And then in 1 Peter 3, let's start in verse 10. It says, For he that will love life, do you like life? And see good days. Do you want to have a good life and see good days within your life? You know, Jacob talked about in, in old, the Old Testament, Jacob said, Few and evil have the years of my life been. If you don't want that to be you and you want to have a good life, so to speak, no, notice what it says here. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, they speak no guile. So we're talking about the blessings of God here. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Here's why. For the eyes of the Lord are over everybody. Is that what it says? I mean, of course, God sees everything. He, he sees everybody. But here's, who, here's, God's, here's, here's the people that are at the top of his list. Over the righteous, it says. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord, so the righteous God is watching. But on the other side, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Look, the people can be saved and do evil. Okay, since you're not saved as a result of, of, of your character or the life you live, you can be saved and be righteous, or you can be saved and do evil. Right. And here it's saying that God's over the righteous. He's watching them, but he's against you if you're doing evil. Amen. So notice the difference on how God deals with these two groups. Verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, because again, there's that disclaimer, right? You, you will go through persecution if you're saved. It doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen to you. But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So you get the idea here, how God is over the righteous. He, he protects the righteous. Turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. You don't have to turn there. But while you're going to Psalm 91... Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him and delivereth them. So again, who is the angel lo the Lord protecting? Who is God protecting? It's those that fear him. Those are the people that will be delivered. Psalm 91, let's start reading in verse 1. It says this, says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So this person is very blessed, or this, this 
who's being described here. These blessings, uh, these are a lot of blessings from God. You say, why? Why is this person being blessed? Well, look at verse 9. We could go through the whole chapter. It's just more blessings. Verse 9, here, here's why this person's blessed. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. This person is walking with God. This person is, God is where is their habitation. God is where, who they're with. God is who they're dwelling with. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall uh, give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. For they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And of course, this is, if you know the story in the New Testament of when the devil was tempting Jesus, this is what he quoted. When, of course, when he took Jesus to the top of the temple and he said, cast yourself down. The Bible says that he'll give his angels, and he quoted this verse to Jesus, but you see, Jesus knew that disclaimer we were talking about, where it doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen to you. That's what, that's what Satan's misunderstanding was. But God will provide uh, by special protection. So by casting yourself off the temple, so to speak, you are tempting God because uh, you know, you're basically saying, no, God, oh, God, always protect me. Don't tempt God. God can do what he wants whenever he wants. Let's keep reading in verse 13. Thou shalt tread... Uh, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Again, it, it specifies again, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high again, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So we, we definitely see the emphasis in the Bible, especially in Psalms, on how God is, is, will protect the righteous. He'll protect the people who, who, is, who are with God, who are on his side. Uh, turn to Psalm 40. Here's the third reason that you should be righteous. Because your righteousness affects, uh, it benefits others. Amen. Benefits other people. It's not just you that will be benefited by it, but other people can be greatly benefited by it. You're there in Psalm 40. Again, we see the context of, of, the, of how righteousness is like a sacrifice. Verse 6, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears thou hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the book, the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight, so God doesn't want sacrifices. What does he want? I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. But notice this, this person who's doing God's will, he loves God's will, Look at the side effect of this. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Again, I have not hid thy righteousness within mine heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. So this person is, is of course, a, a following God's will. But he's saying, I haven't hid it. I haven't hid it. You know, it's like, this is your saved person who doesn't preach the gospel. They're saved. They have this truth that is able to take someone from death and put them under life, and they hide it. And they hide it, they won't let anyone else have it. They won't tell anyone else about it. They're not this person. This person's preaching righteousness. They're, they're, uh, they're not, they haven't hid God's righteousness. And look, here's the idea. Many people will go to hell because no one was righteous enough to preach the gospel to them. They're, because no one was righteous enough to benefit other people with that. No one was able to benefit other people and lead them to the Lord. Likewise, many people will, who are saved will go without living a profitable life because there was no church. There was no church in their area or, or no one in, the, in their church cared. No one was righteous enough to be there and, and start a church for them or, or even if there was a church to uh, help them and lead them in the right way. So your righteousness will greatly affect other people, both with salvation and just helping people in their Christian life. That's the point of a church, right? It's, we're, a church is for saved believers, but we're encouraging each other. We're, uh, we're provoking each other unto, unto good works. Turn to Titus 3.8. Titus 3.8. While you're turning there, I'll read you Daniel 2, uh, Daniel 12.2. It says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So you see how it just keeps repeating. We go and we preach the gospel to people and, and people get in church and start living a righteous life themselves and then they're turned to righteousness and then they can do the same thing to somebody else. That's the cycle that, that God 
that, that God has laid out. You, pre you preach the gospel to someone, they get saved, and they preach, they learn how to give the gospel. Uh, that, that's how we can affect other people in, in a positive way. If they're in Titus 3, look at verse 8. It says, This is a faithful saying, and these I will, that thou affirm constantly. He says, Keep, uh, he's writing to, to Titus, who's a, who's a preacher. He says, Affirm constantly. Be reminding people this. Don't stop t uh, preaching about this. That they which have believed in God, these are saved people, might be careful to maintain good works. You notice, notice what he says about it. These things are good and profitable unto men. Right. Look, our righteousness can be profitable to other people, both in saving them from hell and just helping them out in their Christian life. Turn to Psalm chapter 50. Psalm chapter 50. So, we're talking about boomerang sacrifices, right? Things that we do that have a positive benefit in our lives and to other people. Well, the first one we saw is righteousness. The second one this evening is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, thankfulness. And there in Psalm 50, let's start reading in verse 7. Psalm 50 in verse 7, the Bible says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings, to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? So God's saying, you know, I really don't need sacrifices. I'm not hungry. I don't need it to survive. I, I can, if I need an animal, I can take one whenever I want. I own the world. But look at verse 14. Here's what you should give God. Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. So here's, it's saying that, again, it's comparing another thing to a sacrifice, which is thanksgiving. You should be thankful to God. You should be thankful to God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you don't have to turn there, says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's God's will that, that we are thankful to Him. You're there in Psalm 100, uh, look at verse, five, uh, verse 1, sorry, Psalm 100, verse 1. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath both made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Why? Why should I be thankful unto God? The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. So, when you come to church, when you read your Bible, when you pray, when you serve God with your life, when you do all the things you're supposed to be doing, you should be doing that because you're thankful. Because God did a great thing for you, and, and you're, you're repaying, you're, you're doing, not repaying it, but, but you're, you're, doing what you can to show your thankfulness and your appreciation to God. Turn to Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, let's start reading verse 11. It says, And it came to pass, it's talking about Jesus here, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now I think we read this story and we think, That's pretty bad. I mean, he healed ten people and he only got a ten percent uh, rate on that. Only, only one out of ten people came back to thank him for, for, for doing this great thing for them. And we, we say, That's pretty bad. Well, it's... I think it's a lot worse today, to be honest. Because we go, we preach the gospel to people, Jesus Christ saves them, He saves them from hell, and way less than one in ten people come back to serve God with their life. 
Way less people than one in 10 will actually say, you know what, I was given something I don't deserve. I have the option of just continuing my life the way it is and, and living my life under the chastisement of God and just not, never doing anything for God. But way less than one in 10 people are, are committed to saying, you know what, I'm going to do what I can with this life. Since God is, has had everlasting mercy on me, I'm going to serve him with my life and commit to that. Not many people do that. I mean, think about all the, all the people that get saved. Where are they now? Right? Where, where are they now? They're saved. They're somewhere. They're, they're still living their life, but where are they? What are they doing? Well, they're not, they're not being thankful. I can tell you that much. Turn to Psalm 103. It's interesting is this is actually something when the Bible speaks in Romans 1 about people who have rejected God, this is actually a main characteristic of what they did when they rejected God. Romans 1 21 says, uh, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That's the first thing they did. But the second thing, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. It talks about, that, that's a, something that uh, reprobates. Is they, they, look at, they, they hate God and they reject God because they're not thankful. They're not thankful of the air they breathe, of the life they were given, of everything that God has granted them, the chance to be saved the chance to have salvation. These people rejected that because, why? Because they weren't thankful. They were not thankful. God forbid that that's us, right? Because we can also not be thankful about what Christ did for us. We can also not be thankful. I mean, we're saved, but we cannot be, we can also choose to be unthankful for everything that Christ has done for us. We're there in Psalm 103. Let's look at verse 1. Psalm 103, 1 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice this, verse 3. This could be said of all of us if we're saved. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Look, we, we had a terrible disease of sin, and we had many iniquities that were condemning us, and Christ forgave all of them. Christ forgave all of them. I'd like to read you, because, uh, you know, in America we complain, rightfully so, but we, we, uh, we criticize a lot this entitlement attitude, if you've ever heard that before. There's actually, I have an article here, it's actually from WebMD, and they're not claiming, you know, they are mentioning it's just a, it's an attitude, it's not a disease or anything, but WebMD has actually written an article on what, called What is an Entitlement Mentality? It says this, it says, what is the sense of entitlement? The entitlement mentality is defined as a sense of deserve, deservingness or being owed a favor when little or nothing has been done to deserve special treatment. It's the, quote, you owe me attitude. Entitlement is a narcissistic personality trait. It's not known exactly how this mentality develops, and, and, and it goes on. But it goes to talk about how this is, this is a real thing. This is a real thing that people have written about and noticed, but it's when you, you look at something you're given that you don't deserve, You've done little or nothing to deserve it, and you think you're owed it, or you don't appreciate it. You expect it. You either expect it or you think you're owed it. And, you know, we could apply this to tons of other areas just in, in general, out in society and life. But this evening, I just want to apply this to, to not being thankful. Because you say, why do people get in it? Here's the answer to their question. Here's why people have an entitlement mentality, because they're not thankful. They're not thankful for whatever it is. They, they think it's expected. They think they deserve it. And I, I believe that people do this with salvation. We can do this with salvation. We have not deserved salvation, but yet we, we, and we wouldn't say that we, we deserve it, but we, we, we kind of, it's, it's something expected or it's something that we forget about. We're not thankful for it. And all the blessings of God in our life, I think we can, deserve, we can sometimes get an, an entitlement attitude to it. Things don't go the way we planned and we're upset. Why? Because we, we think we should get that. We, we, we think we're, just, we're, we're entitled a certain, uh, certain, you know, subconsciously we think we're, we're entitled to a certain quality of life. Or we're entitled to a certain uh, thing we want. That's not how it works. It goes on to say, uh, when you believe you're entitled to better treatment than others or that the rules don't apply to you, you're more likely to suffer in the long term. It goes on to talk about how we can have long-term damage with relationships, unhappiness, disappointment, depression. It just, it leads nowhere good. And as much as we... Uh, talk about other people having this in our society, which is a major problem in our society. But we do this to God, and in the same way, it can, it can damage our relationship with God. 
Because, and in, in here's how it affects us. Here's how it's something that, here's why it's a boomerang sacrifice. Because God is not going to bless someone who is unthankful. God is not going to want to do more for someone who just got, when God does help them and when he does do something for them, they just have no thankfulness. It's the same thing in your life. If, if you had two friends, I think we've all had both of these friends, but if you have a friend that's thankful and that's always trying to, uh, you know, you're trying to help them out, they're trying to help you out, and that's a great relationship with your friend. But when you have a relationship with somebody and they're always the one trying to take advantage of you and they're the one who is unthankful of what you do for them and they expect, uh, they expect you to do things for them and, 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 and so on and so forth, who, who do you want to do more for? Who do you do more for? Right? Wh- which of those two friends have you devoted yourself to more? It's the person who is thankful and it's no different with God. Uh, you know, regardless of the quality of our life, um, we, we are not entitled to anything. Um, as mentioned this morning, what we're entitled to is hell. That's what we deserve. That, that is what, you know, we're saved and we're not going there. But if you added everything up that we did, it would, we'd be in the negative by infinity. Uh, that, that is what we deserve. You don't have to turn there, but Psalm 28, verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted to him, and I am helped. This is a great song because it explains this. So he's saying, he's my strength, he's my shield, I'm helped, he's answered my prayer. Therefore, since he's done this for me, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song I will praise him. He's saying, God help me, therefore I praise him. And I think it's interesting because many times in our life, uh, we may be praying for something, we have, may have something that even more than normal, we're praying for, we're concerned about, and we pray and we pray and we pray and we, we, uh, we, we, we want so bad for God to answer our prayer. And he does, and we don't even spend a second to thank him for it sometimes. We can do that sometimes. Because in, in, what, what do you think, how do you make that, that makes God feel? God says, this person has been begging me for this and praying for this for so long, and they, I finally give it to them. And they're like, thanks God, and just, that's it. Just go back to the life they were living or whatever. That's not thankfulness. That's, that's not thankfulness. Turn to Psalm 141. So, boomerang sacrifices. The first one is righteousness. Um, we should be righteous. We should live righteous lives. The second is thankfulness. We should be thankful to God. Uh, the third one is prayer. The third one is prayer. Psalm 141, look at verse 1. The Bible says this, Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste to help me. Give ear to my voice when I cry unto thee. And notice how he, the light he puts prayer in verse 2. He says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Prayer is another thing that is compared to a sacrifice. And again, it's something that, it's not just something we do to God as a picture. It's something that will actually benefit our lives greatly. Uh, greatly. Turn to John 15. John chapter 15. While you're turning there, I'll read you Luke 11, 9. It says, and I, and I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. This is something I, I think about sometimes. Just think about in your life, how, how many blessings will you never receive only because you never asked? I mean, think about that. How many, how many things, you know, uh, how many troubles, you know, it's like that, that, that hymn, I believe it's 353, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's like, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we don't pray. How, how many troubles have you gone through in your life that you didn't even need to go through, that you would not have gone through if you just would have prayed? If you would have prayed for God's protection or, or just asked God to help you with it. He can do a much better job than we can with solving troubles, can he not? There in uh, John 15, the Bible says this, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Here he's saying, he's saying, if you're abiding in me, if you're walking with me, here's a characteristic of that. You will, be, you will ask. You shall ask what you need, and you will ask, and, and I, will, I will give it to you, uh, Jesus is saying. It's a sign that you abide in Christ if you are praying and you are asking him for help in your life. You don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah 30, 33, we've all heard it before, says, Call unto me. And I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. An example I thought about this is, let's say you're, you're with someone in your car, and you're driving, and you get a flat tire. You pull over to the side of the road, and you jack the car up, and you're going to replace the tire. 
have an example here for this. And, uh, and you're, you need to figure out how to get the tire off. And someone says, oh, here, this was in your trunk. Here you go. It's the, it's the perfect socket size. You, you can use this to take the tire off. You're like, no, no, no. And you're like, I'll use this. And you take needle nose pliers and you're trying to undo the bolts in your car and you're stripping out the bolt and you're like, here, just use this. It's the right socket size. And you're like, no, no, I got it. I got it. This is, I'll just use this. And they're like, you don't know, use this. You're going to ruin the bolts. That is how it works with us. Is God is here and he, has, he can answer our, 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 he has the perfect solution. He has, he's, the, he's the perfect solution to the, the problem we're trying to solve. And it's, we're trying to fix it with the needle nose pliers. We're trying to fix it with our own means and, and, and running around trying to fix things ourselves instead of just praying and asking God to help us with it. That, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking the perfect size socket and we're just throwing it away. Like, no, I'm going to use needle nose pliers because it feels better that I'm using my own way of doing it. That is what we do to God. And think about how many bolts we've stripped out in our life because we just won't, we just won't take the tool that's right there. That's right there for us. Uh, you know, I think you know, prayer is arguably the greatest weapon we have or the greatest tool we have as Christians. And also, I think it's the most underused one the most underused, you know, uh, uh, tool that we have. They're in Luke, uh, Luke 18. Or, I'm sorry, turn to Luke 18. Turn to Luke chapter 18. I, I think about it sometimes as uh, people look at prayer, like, you know, it's like the fire extinguisher on the wall in, in a building. It says, break in case of emergency, the glass. That's what prayer is to most people. It's if things are really, really bad, and you've tried the needle nose pliers, you've already stripped out the bolts, then you call the mechanic. Right? It did, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Prayer is something that you, it's the first thing you use. God's the first one you go to with your problems. Not, not once everything else has failed. Not once everything else has failed and nothing else has worked, then you go to God. No, it's, it's the other way around. Why don't you use what works first? You're there in Luke 18. Look at verse 1. The Bible says this, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray, and not to faint. See, prayer will help you. You won't faint. It will strengthen you. Even I've, even, I've thought about this before, but even when God doesn't answer your prayer, it, just, it's, it strengthens you to pray. It strengthens you to ask God for help and to have that closer walk with God, even regardless of the outcome of your prayer. Uh, verse 2, saying, there was, so Jesus is giving an example here. It says, saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man, uh, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him. So this widow is going to this judge. who He's not a good man. He's not just. He's just a selfish person. And this widow comes to him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he saith within himself, Though I fear not God, no regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Saying, I don't care about this lady. I don't care about what she's dealing with. But... Just because she's being annoying and I don't want to hear her anymore, I'll just give her what she wants. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? So he's saying, if this unjust judge is giving this widow what she wants just because he's annoyed, how much more will God, who's perfect and loves you and cares about you, how much more will he give you what you want or what you need uh, more accurately? Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And then, no, this is interesting. Nevertheless, when, when the Son of Man cometh, so he's talking about prayer and asking God, he says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? If, if Christ was to, um, this is, of course, not how the rapture would work, but if Christ was to be here right now and he was to look at us, and when God's looking at our lives right now, do, does he see faith in us? Does he see people who have the faith that, you know what, this just happened, this is going wrong, the most effective thing I can do right now is to pray and ask God for help. Because that takes faith, right? Because that's why we want to use the needle nose pliers, because we want to do something that we can... It's, like, it's why people think they, they can work their way to heaven, because they, wanted, they want something that they can see, and that they can see that they're doing. And it takes faith. It takes faith to pray and, and, and believe that God is the most effective resource you have. So in this idea of prayer, Christ is asking, shall he find faith on the earth? Does God see faith in us right now when, when, when we and how, how we choose to deal with the problems that we have? Just something to think about. Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. 
So the last thing we talked about righteousness. We talked about uh, we talked about uh, prayer. We talked about thankfulness. The last thing, the last sacrifice we should, so to speak, do to God that will benefit us is what the Bible refers to as a broken spirit. I think this one's really interesting. Psalm 51, verse 16, the Bible says, this is David speaking to God, he says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, contrite meaning, um, me, you know, meaning sincere remorse or guilt, a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. Turn to Psalm 40, or, sorry, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. So there's two aspects of this. You say, what's a broken spirit? There, I believe there's two aspects here when he's talking about this. I believe he's talking about uh, 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 an attitude. When you have an attitude of a broken spirit, I believe you are in an attitude of absolute humility and absolute reliance on God, I, I believe is what this is talking about talking about being contrite and having a broken spirit. You're, you're in a low place. You're fully trusting on God. Uh, Psalm 34, 18, you don't have to turn there, says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. There's that, that theme there. Uh, you're there in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, start reading verse 27. Isaiah 40, 27. The Bible says, Why sayest thou, Jacob, and speakest thou, Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. So Israel is saying here, so to speak, we're doomed. God doesn't see us. You know, our, our, our way is hid from him. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't care. He doesn't see. We're doomed. Verse 28, he, he knows what God says to them. He says, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He's saying, haven't you seen the news? Haven't you heard? Are you living under a rock? You don't, I, I see everything. I, I have strength. I have, I don't faint. I don't get weary. I will take care of you. Verse 29, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall be faint to be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Uh, and then the familiar verse, they that wait upon the Lord, those that are of a broken spirit, those that are relying and trusting on God, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Look, why, why would we try to get by on our own limited power? This is like if you're driving uh, down the road and you see your friend sprinting somewhere. You're like, hey, you want to ride? He's like, no, I got it. I only have three more miles left to go. You're like, just get in the car. We'll be there like two minutes. No, I got it. Why would you try to run? Why would you run? God's in the car. Just, just rely on God. He has infinite power. You don't need strength. You don't need, uh, you, uh, you don't need power. God, God's strength is, is perfect in your weakness. Instead of trying to get by in your power, that will run out. That will get weary. Why don't you just rely on God? Why don't you just have a broken spirit and a humble spirit and say, I'm just going to trust God. I'm, just, I'm not going to try to get by on my own power. I'm just going to put all my faith and trust in God. I'm going to pray and ask Him for help. I'm going to trust that He, He has, He is, does not get weary. You're there. Uh, just turn over if you're there in Isaiah 40. Look at verse uh, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. The Bible says, "Fear thou not. I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee." So he says, I'll give, you, I'll give you a ride. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed, he said, you're worried about people who are, uh, who, are, who are against you, who are attacking you. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. He said, don't even worry about them. I'll, I'll take care of it. Just ask. They shall be as nothing. They that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and not find them, even as they that contended with thee. They that were against thee shall be as nothing, as a thing of a knot. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Look, God wants to help us. God doesn't want to see us. I mean, he will judge us if we, if we live a rebellious life, and, if, and we will go through pain if we don't trust on God and choose to get by in our own power. But God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to, God wants us to receive the blessings of these sacrifices. That's why he wants us to do them, it, that, it will, that it may be well with us. Turn to Isaiah 43. 
So in conclusion this evening, I, I just kind of want to recap with all these things. The whole idea is that God wants to help us. God wants it to be well with you. He wants the best for you. Um, you know, these things in the Bible, these commandments, they're not just things we do because God said so. There's a reason that God wants us to do them, that, that it may be well with us, that other people can be benefited, that we can be benefited. Uh, you're there, and just turn over to Isaiah 43. We'll end here. Isaiah chapter 43. We'll look at uh, verse 22. Isaiah 43, 22. I was just reading this this morning, and I thought it was interesting. It really shows the, the, the heart of God, the, the mind of God. It says in verse 22, But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. But thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. He said, you, you wanted nothing to do with me. You were, you were weary of me. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings. Neither hast thou honored me with sacrifices. You're doing nothing that I told thee to do. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. That was, not, that was brought to me no sweet cane with money. Neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. He's saying, you, you haven't done these sacrifices to me. You weren't, you weren't doing anything I told you to do. Instead, you're, what you're serving me with, instead of serving me with, with these offerings, you're serving me with your sin. That's what he's saying. You're just serving me with your, your, your filth, your sin, that you refuse to put aside, that you, res- that you refuse to get rid of. Yet, despite all of our sins, just notice verse 25. This just shows where God is at. He said, you're, you just, uh, you're, just, you're just in sin. You won't do what I want. Verse 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. He's saying, look, I've wiped your sins away. I've, I've, you're saved. Verse 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. God's saying, it doesn't have to be like this. I, I, I've wiped away your, your sin. Put, let, let us plead together. Remember me. Why don't you just live a righteous life? Why don't you put that away? And it really shows the attitude because, yes, God will judge us if we don't live a righteous life. And if he needs to, he will, he will scourge us as, his, uh, as, as sons and daughters uh, in Christ. But ultimately, that's not, that's not God's plan A for our life. God's plan A for our life is that we, we, we offer these, these sacrifices to him, that it's well with us, that, that, so he can bless us, so we can get other people saved, so, people, uh, so other people can get other people saved. That's God's plan for our life. That's, ultimately, that is what God wants for us. He doesn't want to, just like God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Look, a lot of people are going to go to hell. Most people are going to go to hell. The very last verse of Isaiah is actually talking about how people in heaven will look upon the carcasses of those that have transgressed against God and are burning in hell. Because God will do that. God will send people. He's the perfect judge. He will send people to hell for their sin. And he will judge his believers on this earth who do not obey him. But ultimately, that's not what God wants. God doesn't want people to go to hell, and God does not want us to live unprofitable lives. So let's just, this evening, let's just keep that in mind. Instead of just fighting against God, woe unto him that striveth with his maker, right? Instead of just striving against God and fighting against God, look, let's, let's just do these sacrifices, if anything, for our, for our own benefit, because God wants us. He wants to bless us in our life, and he wants the best for us. Let's choose that this evening over just fighting against God. Let's, let's give God the sacrifices that he really wants from us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.